Good afternoon. Welcome to week two of History 1112, World History 2. Uh, I want to start by saying thank you to those who sent me a message or an email saying that you watched the video from the first week. For those of you who did watch the video for the first week, um, I'm going to give you 10 points on your quiz instead of, I think I said five originally. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, keep watching these videos. I can't guarantee an extra credit opportunity each week, but I will do them occasionally as a thank you for taking your time listening to me. Today's lecture is called Western European Expansion and the Ottoman Habsburg Struggle. This is chapter 16 of your book. And I want to first talk about this idea of Christian expansion. Uh, after many years of relative peace between Christian kingdoms and Muslim kingdoms, uh, there was an event called the Reconquista that happened on the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, the Iberian Peninsula, if you're not aware, that is Spain, Andorra, and Portugal. And this, there's a period of religious warfare as early as the 1200s. And this warfare is going to do a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, it's going to lead to this reconquering of territories by Christian monarchs and Christian armies in modern-day Portugal and Spain. Uh, it's also going to lead to Portugal looking for ways to bypass Muslim traders and deal directly with the people of West Africa. Now the resumption of this Reconquista is going to help lead to the age of exploration uh, between the reconquering of cities in Portugal and Spain and then there's the conquering of the of the territory of Granada. Um, and that's really going to be one of the biggest reasons that this happens. Uh, there are some other reasons, though. Uh, for example, strong national governments. Uh, the governments that are going to explore are like France and England and Spain. They all have strong governments by the time we get to the 1500. There's a scarcity of items, um, things like cotton and spices and pepper and um, silk, those aren't readily available in Europe, and so the Europeans need to find that elsewhere. We have some new inventions like the astrolabe, the sand glass or hourglass, the magnetic compass, and then specifically a ship called the caravel. Those inventions are going to make exploration and sailing easier than they were before. Now, your first Europeans to explore are going to be the Portuguese. There was a guy named Prince Henry, the navigator. He opens a school that taught people how to sail, how to do map making, and how to use the sciences to accomplish these goals. And before you know it, by 1500, you have Portuguese ships controlling the western coast of Africa. Now, by controlling the western coast of Africa, the Portuguese ships, they're able to control the flow of gold into Europe. They're able to control the slave trade into Europe. And it makes Portugal one of the strongest countries, if not the strongest country in Europe at the time. Vasco da Gama is a Portuguese sailor. And just to give you an idea of how lucrative this was, he makes a trip to India in the year 1498 and he loses two ships he loses over half of his men it takes him forever and even after paying the cost of his trip and paying for the loss of all of his soldiers and everything uh, he makes over a 600 percent profit so that shows that making trips to to India is worth the time and worth the effort we also have the Spanish that get involved in here. Uh, Ferdinand of Aragon, Isabella of Castile, they get married, they unite Spain in 1469, and they do two different things. Number one, Ferdinand and Isabella, they demand that all the Jews and all the Muslims convert to Christianity, and if they don't convert, they get kicked out. The second thing they do is they hire Christopher Columbus to sail west to India. So Christopher Columbus, he's hired for this job. He leaves in August of 1492, 
and he is going to land in the Bahamas in October of 1492, and he thinks he's off the coast of India. Now, he's going to explore most of the major islands. He never realizes that he's not off the coast of India, and for whatever reason, he is given credit for the discovery of America, even though he's actually one of the last European explorers to make the trip. I had to talk about the Ottoman Empire as well. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, it's established in the Middle East by a Turkish warlord named Osman in the early 1300s. And the name Osman is where we get the Ottomans from. Now, the reason that the Ottoman Turks were able to expand very quickly is because they used gunpowder. They were one of the first groups of people outside of China to use gunpowder in history. And between the years 1290 and 1325, they're able to stretch their territory all the way from northern Africa to Hungary. They're a very culturally diverse empire, and they're able to do that uh, by having a very strong uh, civil service, meaning that the best and the brightest worked for the government. It wasn't based on your family. It wasn't based on your clan, nothing like that. There were tests you had to take to prove if you were worthy of working for the government or not. The Janissaries were a group of soldiers that were used to maintain control of the empire and they were used to expand the territory. Now, these were going to be Christians taken away from their families when they were young, like five or younger, and then they are placed into the home of Turkish people where they are basically slaves and they're taught to speak the language, they're taught the religion. Um, and when they get of age, then they're trained to be soldiers. The Ottoman Empire is going to bring about the end of the Byzantine Empire. That is the successor of Rome. The Byzantine Empire starts in the 300s and it's going to fall apart on April 6th, 1453. That's when the Ottoman Empire and their leader Mehmet II is going to start his attack and then Constantinople is going to fall, meaning it is defeated on May 29th. Constantinople will become the capital city of the Ottoman Empire, and a place called the Topkapi Palace becomes the center of power. That's where the sultans, the leaders of the Ottoman Empire, are going to set up shop. Also within the city of Constantinople was the largest Christian church of its time, known as the Hagia Sophia. The Hagia Sophia is going to become a mosque, and it becomes the largest Islamic mosque in the world. Uh, the Hagia Sophia does still exist if you go to the city of Constantinople, Istanbul. If you go to the city of Istanbul today, uh, you can go and you can visit the Hagia Sophia. It is a mosque still, but it's also a cultural museum. The Topkapi Palace, I didn't mention this a second ago. I, I want you to understand how big the Topkapi Palace is. Uh, it has over 10 mosques inside of it, 14 bathhouses, two hospitals, it had room for 2,000 women and 4,000 horses. It was absolutely huge. And um, the last thing I want to tell you about the Ottoman Empire here, uh, if you're curious what this guy is or who this guy is, it's a picture of Vlad Tepe's Dracul. That is the inspiration for Dracula. There was a territory 
known as Wallachia. And this territory of Wallachia, it's better known today as Romania or Transylvania, which is part of Romania. And Vlad III Tepes becomes the king of Wallachia and the Ottomans decide to fight him. When the Ottomans invade Wallachia, Vlad Dracul or Vlad the Third Tepes is going to put people on stakes. He's going to stake people to the side of the road and he's going to dare the Ottomans to fight him. And because he stakes people and then puts them on the side of the road for, um, you know, basically look like scarecrows. Vlad the Third Tepes becomes known as Vlad the Impaler. And Vlad the Impaler and his thirst for blood is where the modern day myth of Dracula comes from. So if you ever want to know who Dracula is, it's this guy right here. Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Dracul, or Vlad the Third Tepes of Wallachia. It's all the same guy. And if, we, if it wasn't for the Ottoman Empire, we wouldn't have a Dracula. All right, another group of people I need to mention are the Safavid Empire. Uh, they are today's Persians or Iranians. This was a Muslim kingdom that was opposed and they resisted the, the increasing power of the Ottomans. It's a Muslim kingdom run by Shiite Muslims. Um, and the Shiite Muslims, they were actually a minority. Most of the people who lived in the Safavid Empire were Sunni Muslims, the other version of, of Islam. Their best known leader is named Shah Abbas. Shah Abbas was completely crazy. He, uh, he killed his relatives. He thought everybody was out to get him. And he, um, he had body doubles and everything else. I mean, I, I can't think of any other way to put it than this guy was absolutely crazy. He thought everybody was out to get him. Even though the Safavid Empire, they did try to resist the Muslims of the Ottoman Empire, they were partially conquered and their empire grew smaller. Another empire, I'm going to talk about them a little bit more in the future when I talk about India, but I want to mention them, the Mughal Empire. The Mughals were Muslim emperors, Muslim princes who took over traditionally Hindu kingdoms. And because they're Muslims who take over these Hindu kingdoms, the Hindu people are going to become second-class citizens within their own, their own um, kingdoms. The Mughal leaders are extremely wealthy because they control trade routes, they control trading supplies. There are several very strong and well-educated leaders amongst the, the Mughal Empire, but they're eventually going to fall apart because of a civil war. One of the Mughal princes named Aurangzeb is going to try and force everybody to become Hindu or Muslim, even, and he's going to prohibit Hinduism. And when Aurangzeb forces everybody to become Muslim and prohibits Hinduism, uh, the everyday people rise up against him. Now, Aurangzeb is probably just as crazy what Shah Abbas was for the Safavid. Uh, he's going to go so far as to tell all unmarried women they must get married. And if they don't get married, then they would be put to death. All right. The other group of people to talk about in here are the Habsburgs. The Habsburgs, they were originally a really powerful family that married into other royal families. And through marriages and by knowing who to become friends with, the Habsburgs are going to become royalty themselves. Uh, the Habsburgs throughout their time in history are going to be rulers over Spain, Italy, Germany, Austria, Romania, uh, the Netherlands, I think Belgium, 
every, they pretty much end up ruling, at least temporarily, all of Europe with the exception of France and England. And honestly, I think they may have married into the royal family of France too. Now, in the year 1550 or so, the Habsburg Empire is going to be divided. Charles V is going to give his son, Philip II, control over part of his territory. So Philip II gets control of Spain, the city of Naples in Italy, the Netherlands, and the empire in the Americas. When Charles dies, he's going to give his brother, Ferdinand I, control of Austria, Bohemia, which is today the Czech Republic, Hungary, and the Ottoman, or the uh, Holy Roman Empire. And it was hoped that his son and his brother would help each other and assist each other. And in reality, they didn't really do much together. So the two different branches of the Habsburgs families, uh, they kind of go on their own. Philip II is going to be extremely afraid of the Ottoman Empire. Philip II is going to be deathly afraid of Muslims. And he's going to uh, restart the Inquisition. And he's going to force Muslim people in his part of the Habsburg territories to convert to Christianity. Eventually, Philip II will expel all of the Muslim residents from his territory in the year 1609. Ferdinand I, he's not much better. He's going to go directly to war with the Ottomans, and Ferdinand I is going to war with the Ottomans off and on for years. Now, eventually, the Habsburg Empire, they do become the largest empire in Europe. They use all the money from their American empires to fund the strengthening of their government and the strengthening of their, their empire. They're going to use all the money that they get from the Americas to fund their wars against Islam. But the Habsburgs will eventually start the slow decline in the mid-1700s until finally the Austrian-Hungarian Empire falls apart after World War I in 1919. So the Habsburgs, they last a long time, but they're not with us anymore more. Um, primarily because World War I just kind of wiped them out. Now this video is not very long. Um, it's going to end up being just a little bit over 20 minutes. Um, for this week, I want to let you know that you do have one quiz. And you do have one set of discussions to do. So if you would, do me a favor and read chapter 16. It's about 23 pages or so review this video and this PowerPoint, and then make sure you get those quizzes and that discussion done before next Monday, the 30th at 1159 PM. As always, I finish every video this way. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please email me. I'll be glad to answer and help in any way I can. Thank you again for those that watched the first video. I hope you continue watching and I will have some future extra credit opportunities available for you. Until next week, we'll see you soon. Bye.